Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys are all having a good day so far. So today, what we're going to be working on is the law of conservation of mechanical energy. So well, before we start, let's enjoy the pun. Roger, little kitty, cute meme. Potential, it converts into kinetic. Kitten's about to pounce. So for let's review a little bit the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so remember, our first law is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, just transferred from one form into another. And our second law of thermodynamics is that no energy transfer is 100% efficient. So that means that we are going to have some energy lost in the form of heat um, when any time we have any energy transfer. Um, or it could even be other waste types of energy such as sound. So when you look at uh, your internal combustion engines in your motorized vehicles, the good ones are ballpark of 30-ish percent efficient. Well, that remaining seven, the, of 100% of the chemical energy in your octane gasoline, about 30% of that will be converted into kinetic energy and the rest is going to be converted into heat and sound. Okay. All right. So when we're going to be talking about the conservation of mechanical energy, we're going to be talking about the conservation of potential energy being transferred into kinetic or kinetic into potential. So we're going to be talking about how whole, the energy of the system as a whole stays the same, but the type of energy that it transfers into that can change depending on the scenario. So this is a concept that is going to play into Physics 30 next year. So please do your best to uh, keep up with this one. And conservation of energy is going to be haunting you as long as you're doing physics. And chem, actually. This shows up in chem a lot, too. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, for our part here, uh, we've talked about how there's... Uh, different types of energy. So there's mechanical. So we've got nuclear, electrical, light energy, kinetic energy, potential, heat, magnetic, spring potential. And for the most part, though, you can classify all of these as into one type of like energy or another kinetic or potential. Potential stored energy. So nuclear energy is generally nuclear potential and stored in the nucleus of atoms. And then when it's released and you have the radiation, well, a good chunk of radiation is the kinetic energy of particles. Okay? And then when we have um, heat, for example, um, when you're measuring the temperature of a substance, for example, air, the temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of how fast the particles are moving. The warmer they are, the faster the particles are going. Okay. So mechanical energy, ladies and gentlemen, is defined as the sum of all kinetic and potential energy in an entire system at any particular point in time. Okay. So EM is our mechanical energy in joules, EK is our kinetic energy in joules, and EP is our potential energy. So we just have the sum of these guys together. Okay, and I think this is on your data sheet. Of course, I can't find my data sheet right now. There it is. Okay, pretty sure this is on here. Okay, no, it isn't. So that is being not on there is something you guys are going to have to either memorize or be right down on your data sheet. So what I would do, pause the video, write this onto your data sheet, because we don't have exams, you don't actually have to memorize it. So if we did have exams, I'd write on test. Well, we can do it anyway. There you go. Have it. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, we already talked a bit about our law of conservation of energy um, before we started the lesson here. And it says in an isolated system, the mechanical energy is going to remain constant. Now, an isolated system, that's something we're going to talk a little bit more down here. So that would mean that as energy is going to be transferred, the sum of the kinetic and potential is going to remain the same. Okay, so as that object is moving, the total sum of energy is going to be the same. 
Okay. And our kinetic energy is going to be converted back and forth in between potential because energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now, in that case, we are assuming key piece isolated system. So neither energy nor matter can enter or leave the system. So that means 100% of the potential energy when dropping a ball, say, is going to be converted into kinetic. That means there's no friction. Okay, Zippo friction. Now, in reality, do we have Zippo friction? No, we have friction. So this is going to be where there's no energy or matter leaving or entering the system. No friction, no external forces. Okay? We're going to be doing most of our math in an isolated system. So other systems that we'll be talking about later um, are also closed systems. This is where energy can enter or leave the system, but matter can't. So that's more what we see in reality as a closed system and or even an open system where matter comes and goes as well. So inside of an isolated system, our law of conservation of energy holds fully true in within those individual pieces. As soon as we have a closed system, we have to take into account energy lost as heat. Okay, so that conservation of energy is still being maintained but heat is just frictions causing energy to be lost in the form of useless energy of heat. We're going to be doing most of our math in an isolated system. Okay, so we're going to make a graph. And here we have, this is going to be our energy. And the units are going to be joules. And this is going to be the position of an object. And we're going to keep um, the idea simple. Um, if you have um, an item and you're going to throw it into the air and then catch it again. Uh, let's see, what do I have? One around here that I could throw and not break anything. Now I got a ball of yarn over here somewhere. Okay, so I have a ball of yarn. Okay, so if I take this ball of yarn and I throw it up in the air and catch it, that's going to be kind of what we're going to be graphing. We're going to be taking this ball of yarn and we are going to be, let's not catch, throw it in the air, up and down, let's drop it. So we take the ball of yarn and we're going to drop it. So up here, this ball of yarn, it has 100% potential energy right now. When I drop the ball of yarn, Let's try it again. When we drop the ball of yarn, the energy is being converted into kinetic. Okay. So let's start with the red line. And I'm going to use that to represent our potential energy. So position A is going to be up here. This is position A where the ball of yarn is being held in the air. So that means all of the energy. I'm going to move the position A over. There we go. So all of the energy at this point is going to be potential energy. And position B here is right before the ball of yarn hits the ground. So as the ball of yarn falls, its potential energy is going to decrease. Okay, But what energy is increasing? As you let go of the ball of yarn, the kinetic energy of that yarn is going to increase. And whatever we lose in potential is going to be converted into kinetic. Okay. Now, when I draw my when I draw my line, notice I have to be I have to be careful here. I cannot have my kinetic energy go above this line here. This maximum amount of potential energy is, the, is going to be the maximum kinetic energy that the ball of yarn can get, okay? As if I was to draw my line way up here, well, guess what? I've invented perpetual motion and that doesn't exist, okay? An infinite amount of energy. So my line's gonna go up about there. It's gonna be actually a straight line, so keep it even, try and keep it even, use a ruler. Now, Notice here at the end of position B, 100% of the energy is now kinetic. However, if we were to add these together, now let's, let's actually label this here. Let's say the, the blue is our kinetic energy. Now our green is going to be our mechanical energy. Now remember the mechanical energy is the sum of both 
kinetic and potential energy in a system. So, well, guess what? This plus this, this plus this, no matter where we add it along, it's going to be the same. So, assuming we're in an isolated system, the mechanical energy is going to be constant in that system. So, that means no matter where the energy is, whether the, you know, it's up here, all of yarn is here, here, or right before it hits the ground, you're still going to have the same amount of mechanical energy present. Okay, so there's our graph, and we're going to look at a couple of other graphs as well. So the, this was a line graph, and now we're going to represent this in bar graphs. Help visualize the concept before we do some math. All right, so what you all can see are three different graphs, and in this point here, we have our... Um, position A, B, and C, where a guy is throwing the ball in the air. So let's do a bit of labeling here. So you're going to be doing position A is going to be right here, just as the ball leaves his hand. Okay. We are going to label position B to be exactly at the halfway point. And then we are going to have position C as the maximum height when throwing an object in the air. So position A is when you the object immediately leaves the hand. Position B is the halfway point. Position C is the maximum height. So that's the kind of motion we're getting. Okay. All right. So let us start with our graph for position A. Okay, and this is our energy in C. Yeah, this is our energy in joules. And this is the type of energy. Have to label your axes. So ladies and gentlemen, let's assume that we have 10 joules of energy. Now, remembering mechanical energy is going to be constant. Okay, so that means if we've got 10 joules of mechanical energy in position A, 100% of that energy is going to be kinetic. So that would mean I'm going to have a bar here. I really hope you guys are using rulers. I can't use a ruler on the fancy writing tablet. So for our potential energy, there's not going to be any. Because right here or at least in in comparison to where the ball starts. Like that's going to be the point in which we're relative to. Okay, so relative to that point where there's going to be no potential energy. Okay, so all of the energy is going to be kinetic. All right. When we jump over to position B, okay, now assuming we are in an isolated system as that ball rises in the air isolated system what's going to happen to the mechanical energy it's going to stay the same so we are still going to have 10 joules of mechanical energy okay the mechanical energy is going to remain constant However, now let's look at what proportion of that energy is going to be kinetic and which is going to be mechanical. Well, we're at the halfway point. We definitely have potential energy, but the ball is still moving. And exactly at that halfway point, it's going to be five joules of energy of each. Okay. Okay, so when that ball is halfway through the air, it has some kinetic, it's got some potential. Okay, all right. Now I'm going to scroll up and we're going to go to a graph at point C. So that would be your point C. Well, we're at maximum height up here, and we are still at 10 joules of mechanical energy. The sum of our potential and kinetic is still going to be 10, assuming an isolated system. Okay. Well, when we're at the very, very peak, remember from kinematics, when we took our, our objects and we throw the ball up, in this case, ball of yarn, um, 
at that maximum height, its velocity is going to be zero. Okay, so which means it's going to have no kinetic. But all of its energy there is now going to be stored as potential energy. So we're going to have 10 joules of potential energy there. Okay. All right. Cool beans? Cool beans. Oopsie. There we go. So let's go on to look at a different system. So we still have three graphs and we have uh, different positions here. So we are going to label this system here as position A and this one is B, this one is C. Okay, so what we have here is we have a ball that's running and hitting into a spring. As this ball, this is just when it touches this, just when it touches that spring. So when the ball is going to come in and hit the spring, we, all of our energy right here is kinetic. And as the ball is moving, it's going to start to compress that spring. So some of the energy is going to be stored in the spring. Some of the energy is going to be kinetic in the ball because the ball is still moving here. And well, here we have the all the energy is stored in that spring and the ball is not going to be moving. No, not moving so much. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go with, well, let's make this one position A. Okay. So we have, once again, with our graph, I'm just going to scroll down a wee bit. So there we go. You can see that axis easier. Let's say, take these 10 joules. Okay. Our total energy is 10 joules. Okay. Now of that 10 joules in position A, what proportion is kinetic? 10 joules. The spring has not come into contact or has not been squashed by the ball yet. So all of the energy is going to be kinetic. So the mechanical energy being the sum of potential and kinetic, no potential energy stored in that spring, all the energy in kinetic. Okay, let's write up here, let's make this one position B. Okay, so position B, well, assuming an isolated system, that means we're not losing any, losing any energy to friction. So we are still going to have a sum of 10 joules. Well, here we have some of the kinetic energy lost being absorbed by that spring. Okay. So let's say with position B, oh, I don't know, we've got, we still have some left. Okay four joules left. That spring's been compressed fairly good. However, we are still going to have some, we've got a decent amount of potential. Okay, well we've got 10. I mean, you, there's four in kinetic. Well, how much is stored in the spring? There have to be six. Because the sum of the EP and the sum of the EK are going to have to equal this EM in an isolated system. And that's what we're working with right now. Okay. So I'll scroll down a bit. So we're going to look at our next graph here at position C. Now at position C, let's assume that this is still moving a little bit. Well, the sum of all of our energy is going to still be 10. And um, please use a straight line, a ruler to get your bar graphs to look somewhat neater than mine. Now here we got very little kinetic energy left. The ball is only moving a teeny bit. So if we have only a teeny bit of EK, let's just say two joules left. Well, what would be stored in the spring here? You should have eight. Okay. There we go. So I know they're not even close to straight, but sadly I can't use a ruler on this writing tablet. So that's our, our big concept here is that the mechanical energy is going to be the sum of all potential and the sum of all kinetic energy in the system. Okay. So that's going to be 
the concept that you're going to need to keep in mind when it starts coming to your calculations. Okay, shall we begin? Let's. All right, so we're going to scroll down a bit here. And we are going to be looking at a pendulum. Now, once again, we're going to pull my keys in here to be our pendulum demo. Same way as it would be in class. Okay, so it'll be my keys. So here's our pendulum. Okay, so based on what you can see, it looks like the pendulum's kind of right on the ground there. Just going to match the diagram. Okay, so when you take the pendulum and it's going to be moved up to what is on your diagram is 13 centimeters. So let's think for a moment. Right here where I'm holding the pendulum, that is where all of your EP is. And when you release it, the energy is being converted from potential to kinetic. So potential, and then as you release it, potential decreases and kinetic increases. The max kinetic is going to be here, okay? And then as the pendulum continues to swing up this way, that means that our kinetic energy is going to be decreasing, okay? And then our potential increasing until we're up here. Now, if this was an isolated system, this would go on forever. Kinetic and potential just constantly um, converting back and forth. However, this is not an isolated system, okay? This is a closed system. So my keys are slowing down. Well, where is that energy going? It's being converted into heat from friction and the other external forces. Okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, the pendulum is pulled aside and then released as shown in the diagram. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Determine the speed at the bottom of the swing. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, this is something you would have definitely done for your calculations last year in Science 10. Okay. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, that what we've got is a... Oops. Our mechanical energy here in position A, we're going to call this position A, is going to equal the mechanical energy at position B. Let's call this position B. Okay, Because remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the energy is going to be transferred, okay, from A to B. Okay, it's going to be transferred from kinetic to from potential to kinetic. But the sum of all those energies is going to be sa the same, assuming we're in an isolated system. Okay, and for your purposes, we're always going to assume you're in an isolated system unless the question asks you to determine, is this an isolated system? And we'll talk about that one later. That's later in the video. Okay, so let's think for a moment here. Our sum of the energies here, potential energy at point A plus all the kinetic energy at point A is going to equal all the potential energy at point B plus all the kinetic energy at point B. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a scenario where you absolutely, absolutely have to be equating your values. You cannot calculate this and then equate it to this to solve later, and I'll show you why in a moment. Okay. Oh, I'm going to give you a little strategy here. Okay. Your strategy is when you are going to be comparing two points in one system, you are going to use your conservation of energy. Okay. So that's your strategy. So ladies and gentlemen, let's put in our equations. Now we have very little information here. We only have the height, we have nothing else, all right? That is exactly why you need to equate here. There is no other strategy that's gonna work in this case. So pretend, now let's think for a moment. At A, do we have potential or kinetic? 
only potential. The kinetic at point A is zero. At point B, do we have all kinetic or all potential? We have all kinetic, we have no potential. So that means we can cancel those out right away. And the potential energy at point A is therefore going to equal the kinetic energy at point B. Okay. So at for our equation for potential energy is MGH. And our equation for kinetic energy is one half MV squared. Now, this is something hopefully you guys talked a little bit about in science 10. Now, the mass of this pendulum, that mass is the same. When you have an entity that is the same on both sides of that equal sign, what can you do with it? Cancel it. And I'll show you why it works that way. Well, if I'm going to rearrange this equation and I'm going to divide by mass, well, my mass is the same number. Well, I then divide over here my mass. Well, it works out to be they just cancel. Okay, so if I'm going to rearrange that equation that way, it winds up being canceled anyway. So instead of going through that, notice we don't have mass. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen, because the mass is not changing in the, in the equation, we don't need the mass to solve. We can simply cancel it now because those values are the same on both sides of that equal sign. So that means we're going to be left with GH is going to equal 1 half V squared. So determine the speed at the bottom of the swing. Well, there is our speed. Now remember when getting rid of a half, you can divide by a half or multiply by two. I don't care which one you choose, which method you choose. I like multiplying by two, so I'm going to multiply by two to cancel my half. And then I'm going to wind up with V squared is going to equal 2 GH. And then I'm going to square root to get rid of that. So my V, the speed, is going to equal the root of 2 GH. Okay. I'm going to scroll down here so I don't have to write on my face. Okay. Now, we have G. We always have G, which is 9.81 meters per second. Height. Well, the height was 13 centimeters. And that has to be converted into meters. You can't do your math in centimeters. Okay, so convert that to meters. So 2 times 9.81 multiplied by your 0.13. Square root the lot. And your speed was, once you get that in your calculator, okay, and as always, we want sig digs. And your units. And there's your answer. Okay. So when we're dealing with a lot of these laws of conservation of energy, most of the time I'm not giving you mass. Truly, guys, most of the time I am not giving you the mass. You are going you must equate these things this way, and you must solve them in this fashion. So I didn't even give you enough information to find the mass. Okay. And truly, it doesn't matter. You don't need the mass because it cancels. The, ma the mass is not changing how this object is going to move. Okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin with number two. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this one's a little bit more complicated. So we do have two masses here in this case, but we've been asked to calculate something different here. So a metal ball is fired from a gun that is powered by a spring that is compressed 21 centimeters. Okay, well, we're back to springs. So the X, so the distance that the spring is compressed is 21 centimeters. And we're gonna convert that into meters. Okay. And the metal ball has a mass of 64.57. Okay. Well, I am going, because we have two masses here. We've got the mass of the ball and the mass of the pendulum. So I'm going to start labeling these things here. So this is MB is going to be the mass of the ball. And that is 64 grams. No inappropriate grams jokes, guys. 
<laughs> yeah, you know who I'm talking to. So we have to convert that into kilograms because kilograms are the standard SI units. So 0 0.06457 kilograms. And then we have a mass of a 1.5 kilogram pendulum. So NP is going to be 1.5 kilograms. The, all right, so the ball is fired from this toy gun and it sticks to the pendulum, causing the pendulum to be raised 9.3 centimeters. Okay, that's our height. We need to convert that to meters. I'll scroll down a bit so it can rain a little bit easier. Okay. Okay, so there we go. We have our items listed out here. Uh, vertically from its equilibrium position. Calculate the spring constant. Okay, calculate K. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's draw out what we have. So, we need to think cautiously here. We cannot use kinetic energy. Why? We don't have speed. We do not have speed or the ability to easily find speed as part of our calculations here. So we need to think about where this energy is coming from. So in position A of the system, we've got a spring inside of this toy gun and it's in contact with the ball. Well, in position, when the ball is fired, here's our pendulum. I'm going to make this a square so it's easy to see. The ball comes and it hits this pendulum. It becomes embedded in it and then it moves up here and it moves upwards to a height of 9.3 centimeters. Well, when the ball is compressed before it is fired, what kind of energy do we have here? Spring potential, our elastic potential. So we have potential energy in the form of springs. That's, it should be an S. Okay. No, we'll just write spring. And over here, what type of energy do we have here? We have gravitational potential. Okay, so because we have the different types of gravitational potential, and we're going to assume an isolated system, so that means all of the energy is going to remain constant. So we are going to have potential, it'll be converted into kinetic in here, and then it'll be then turned into potential here. Now we don't need to do our math based on these intermediate stages, we can do our math solely at A and B. So the mechanical energy at point A is going to equal the mechanical energy at point B. Okay, so let's, our potential energy plus EK is going to equal our potential energy plus DK. And this is at point A, this is at point B. Now at point A, when the spring is compressed and the ball's right there, do we have any kinetic? Nope, no kinetic energy. At point B, when the pendulum is at its maximum height, do we have any kinetic? No, we don't. So in this case, our spring potential energy, or our elastic potential energy, is equal to our gravitational potential energy. So our 1 half kx squared is going to equal mgh. Okay, now this is going to where it's going to become a bit trickier here. Okay, we've got now once again, look at this, guys. We can't easily, we can't really solve this easily without equating. Okay, this one it is possible to do without equating, but it's going to be trickier. Okay, and as some scenarios you can't solve without equating. When it comes to these conservation of energy equations, I would just automatically go to this method, okay? 
So I'm trying to find K. So that's what my goal is. So I'm going to get rid of everything else. I'm going to multiply by 2 and I'm going to divide by x squared. So k is going to equal to 2mgh and we're going to then be dividing by x squared. Okay. All right. I'm scroll down a bit. Okay, so I can start putting my numbers in. Now, mass, ladies and gentlemen. What is the mass at point B? Is it just 1.5? No, it isn't. The ball has become embedded inside that pendulum. So that means our mass is 1.5 kilograms plus the 0 0.06457 kilograms of the ball. You have to add them, okay? Either in the equation like this or before, it doesn't matter. Now multiply that by 9.81, and our height, which we calculated earlier, is the 9.3 centimeters. Make sure you write down the meters version. So 0, 0.93, okay? And then we're going to divide the lot by x squared, which we've been given earlier. Don't forget to square. And after very carefully putting all of your numbers into your equation, you're going to wind up with the lovely value of 64.73 dot, 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 dot. All right, units, sig digs. So we need uh, how many? Two, because our mass is two sig digs. So that's going to be 65 newtons per meter. Okay, so as always, ladies and gentlemen, the trickiest part about this isn't the calculations, it's just figuring out the setup and which numbers are going to be used where. Okay, all right, so that was a pretty tricky one. Now, this one's fun. I love this next one roller coasters. Everybody loves roller coasters. Well, I used to when I'm younger, now that I'm old, I don't. Uh, last time I was on a roller coaster, I was, didn't enjoy it as much as I did when I was a kid. I guess when you get older, everything starts to hurt, and then you get battered around in a roller coaster car. You come out and you're just sore. Same way I can't go tobogganing anymore as a kid. You know, run and you fly down the hills and crash into things and bounce back up and get going. If I go tobogganing now, it'd be like a week, kind of like two months with a chiropractor appointments and massage appointments to get me back and functioning again after everything's been bashed around and hurt. See, he just does it too. Enjoy being young and while well, well, you, well, you can. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, our roller coaster car has a speed of 1.5 meters per second at point A. What is the speed of the car at point C if the track is frictionless? So if the track is frictionless, that means that we are going to be in an isolated system. Now, in reality, is the track frictionless? If the track was frictionless, then <laughs> this car wouldn't even be staying on the track. It'd be just boom, off it goes. All right, so we're looking at point C. So here's point A and there's point C. So this point here in the middle is completely irrelevant. Okay? We do not need to worry about it. We are comparing two different points in the same system. That means we're going to be using our conservation of energy. Okay, so let us think about what we have here. With conservation of energy, mechanical energy at point A is going to equal the mechanical energy at point C. Okay. Now, when we expand each equation, our kinetic energy at point A plus the potential energy at point A is going to equal the kinetic energy at point B plus the potential energy at point B. Now, the thing here, ladies and gentlemen, we have both potential and kinetic. The car is moving here, and it's 12 meters above the ground. The car is moving here, and it's 4 meters above the ground. We can't cancel any of these out. None of these are zero. Mm -hmm. This is where if we were in class, I'd be expecting you guys to go, no, or groan, or something. Okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have to expand this the entire way. So 
1 half mv squared plus mgh equals 1 half mv squared plus mgh. All right. Now, this is where it's going to become tricky. I can go through and cancel out the masses in all of these. Why can I do that? Two reasons, and you have to watch for both. This is super important. You need to watch for both of these reasons for when you are allowed to cancel. One, the values have to be the numerically the same. The mass of this card is not changing. The mass of the card is still the mass of the card up here and down here. Two, the M or value you want to cancel all the way through must be in every term. Remember, the plus signs are going to separate the terms. M, 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 and M. The mass is in every single term. So therefore, I can cancel it. Now, mathematically, why can I do that? Well, I have the ability to factor out M on both of these halves. So I can factor out the M here. Let's just do this for mathematical proof, I guess. So M, 1 half B squared, okay, plus my MGH. Oops, I never factored that out. Okay, plus the GH. I don't even need the brackets. Okay, well, I don't need them there. I need them there. There we go. Okay, so I factored out mass on this side. I can factor out mass again because that, that variable is the same in both terms. So M is then going to leave me with 1 half V squared plus GH. Well, now look, I have one of each of these M variables. And I've done mathemat a mathematically correct way to get it separate. And the same way we did previously is if I divide out that M as if I'm rearranging an equation, I divide M here, well, it cancels over here. Okay, so that means I can cancel out my M's. I do not have to factor out. This factoring out was just showing you why this works and why you ha can only cancel out when there is a letter in all of the terms, okay? So I can cancel out all of these M's for that reason, okay? All right, so I am now going to look at what I've got left. I have my one half V squared plus GH is going to equal one half E squared oops, plus GH. Okay. Now what we should have been doing earlier is we should have been giving the guys A's and B's, but let's do it now. Okay. So A, A, B, C, well, tights and C in the question. Doesn't really matter, but we will be consistent. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need to find the value of V speed at C. So, this is our goal. That is what we are going to need to try and isolate here. Okay. So, let's do a bit of rearranging. Oopsie, there we go. All right, we have some more space. So that's our goal. Let's subtract out that GH. Okay, so I'm gonna minus GHC, okay? So one half V squared at C is going to equal one half V A squared plus G H A minus G H C. Okay, so I have minus G H C from both sides. All right, so to make our lives easier, 
Uh, you can, you're more than welcome to put numbers in now and solve for this mess. And then you can get rid of the one half and the squared after. Let's do that. Okay. So one half V squared at C. Okay. One half V at A. Now the speed at A, ladies and gentlemen, was 1.5 meters per second. Square that. Plus... 9.81 times the height at A, which according to the diagram is 12, 12 meters, minus 9.81 times the height at C, which according to your diagram is 4. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot cancel out G. Why can't I do that? It's not in every term. Okay, so the G is only in two terms up here. Even though it's in here twice, it's not in the third or the fourth term. You cannot cancel out G. Okay, you have to do the math with that one. All right, so solve for this carefully, ladies and gentlemen, very carefully. Put it into your calculators. What I would do personally, solve for each of these pieces individually. Okay, heck, I'm going to do that here. Okay, so this guy here, we're going to wind up with is your 1.125 plus this guy here, 117.72. Okay, minus 39.24. Okay, you have these values now solve. Putting this into your calculator in one big stretch is going to be the definition of a nightmare. Okay, don't do that. So now, once this is in your calculator, which is definitely doable, our value of one half v squared at point C is going to equal 79.605. Okay, I need to scroll down. So I've got some more space. Okay, well, I need to get rid of the half. So I'm going to multiply both sides by two. So V squared at point C after being multiplied by two. And then you're going to square root, okay, to get rid of that. Okay, V at point C, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be 12.617E dot 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 and sig digs, that rounds up to sig digs, 13 meters per second. All right. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's a long question, really long question. And there's a lot of math involved with that one. So you guys really need to take your time and just really pay attention to where those numbers are going. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend that you guys pause the video or stop it or something and do a couple of these guys, do a couple practice problems, get comfortable with, uh, with this concept and then come back and restart at this point, write the time down or something, and then go on to the next half of the lesson. As what I would do is I would have taken a break at some point throughout this topic and then come back the next day in class. So you can treat it like that. But because we're not in class and as you can see I'm at home, um, we are gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep filming, film all in one shot. Take a break, pause, go get some food, work through a few practice problems, and then come back. We're back! All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the idea of a closed system. So, I know I alluded to it earlier in the video here. And this is more practical. This is generally what we see with physics. OK, 
Okay. So a closed system, ladies and gentlemen, systems in reality, they're not isolated. We've got friction. We've got stuff coming in and out of the system all the time. So a closed system is where matter can't leave and can't enter, but energy can. Matter is conserved. Energy is not conserved in the system. Okay. So the energy in the universe is still the same, but it just means some energy has left the system and gone into the air around the system. Okay. And that's normal. That's what happens. That's why when I'm holding my keys in the air and they're swinging back and forth is why they eventually stop because they air resistance and gravity and all the other forces are hindering this movement. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, in a closed system, we need to account for a loss of energy. Now, when we say a loss of energy, we don't mean energy is destroyed and never found again. It just means that energy is being converted into a different form. Like my desk lamp, for example. I don't know if I'm looking at my desk lamp. Um, you can see my pink desk lamp right there. Now, my desk lamp is producing a lot of heat. It's a very old lamp, right? It's an old IKEA lamp. Like, yeah, and touch the desk lamp. It's warm. That's wasted energy. The energy is still there when I reach over and touch the lamp. It's the energy from the electricity is still there. It's just not being in the form of light. Okay. I should really get better bulbs for that lamp. Okay. But hey, it's been the, honestly, it's been the same light bulb since when did I buy that lamp? I got it to go to university when I went to university. That was my 19 when I started university. I'm 33 now. So that, that's an old lamp. Been around for a long time. Same light bulb. Same light bulb. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, it means that work is being done against the system. Okay. That there's friction or there's something that's preventing the type of motion we're looking at. So we don't have to draw this next graph. This one's already done for you here. Um, what we can see here, though, is let's label it, though. This is right now, this graph has no labels. It's got no axes labeled. It's got no title. Okay, so we can say it's energy versus position. And this is our energy in joules. This is position A. This is position B. There we go. Look at that. It's amazing how much labeling your axes makes a big difference. All right. So now we need to label our lines. Now this one here, this dotted line would be mechanical energy in an isolated system. Okay. Now, less than subtle hint, ladies and gentlemen, isolated systems and closed systems are going to be a very, very common theme in Physics 30 for our first unit next year. Okay, so that is the total amount of energy that should be in the system if it was isolated. However, as we have our ball of yarn dropping, now look at this ball of yarn. That's got a huge surface area. There's going to be a ton of wind resistance on this. So when you're going to be taking the ball of yarn and dropping the ball of yarn, a decent amount of energy of, of the potential energy here is not going to be transferred into kinetic. It's going to be transferred into heat and sound and other types of energy. Like when you drop it, you can kind of hear it a little bit. Okay. So that all that lost energy is what we see here, okay? So this here, that gap, is the work done against the system. That's the air resistance, that's the friction, okay? That's the energy being turned into light and sound, okay? This red line is our kinetic energy, this blue line is the potential, and this gray line is the mechanical. So we have energy that's not doing anything for the system. It's just leaving, 
okay, to go into the surroundings. Okay, and that's what that is. Okay, sounds good? All right, so there's less calculations with this one. This uh, section is a little bit shorter. You can see we're on our second last page here. All right. So let's look at this one. When a bouncy ball is dropped from a height of one meter, the bouncy ball can never bounce up to the initial one meter height. Explain why this is the case. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, well, explain why this. I should say why this is the case. So first of all, in reality, we are not in an isolated system. We're in a closed system. Okay. Okay, and when you're in a closed system or not an, an isolated system, energy is going to be lost. Now, when we say lost, we mean lost is in the context of the system, not disappeared or destroyed forever, because that's impossible, as far as we know. Um, so energy is going to be lost to the environment environment yeah spelling's not my strongest suit i think i got that one okay i uh, as heat etc okay um you're also going to have energy lost with it and where is that energy going to be lost as it's going to be lost to friction it's going to be lost to air resistance and when a bouncy ball is dropped it's going to be squished and then come back out that's actually how bouncing works is it squishes and deforms and goes back so well that that ladies and gentlemen is all going to take energy and there's going to be heat lost in that okay and because of that the mechanical energy of the system is going to decrease. So when the mechanical energy decreases, what that means is that you are going to have, by the time we go from the top to the bottom, we've got less kinetic than we start, than potential than we started with. So that means, well, that energy that's now, and that kinetic goes into destroying the deforming of the ball, that kinetic and the elastic squishiness of the ball can cause it to bounce back up, well, it's losing more. So it's not going to ever make it back up to that full height, okay? Because of the energy lost to the environment. Sounds good? All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, last question of the video. Now, this is the type of thing that your question you're going to see in Physics 20 about closed systems. This is actually going to be what you're seeing in physics 30 or similar to it when we talk about closed systems in our first unit. Now, is you're going to have to determine is a system closed or is a system not closed, okay? So you're not going to have to determine, um, we're not gonna be adding friction to our calculations, we're just gonna be seeing is friction present, okay? So a 1,000 car is initially at rest at the top of a 15-meter high hill. Let's just list down some of the things we have. So we've got 1,000 kilograms is at the top of a 15-meter high hill, and it starts to roll down the hill. At the bottom of the hill, the car has a speed of 15.5 meters per second. Is the system isolated or not? Well, and what energy transformations occur? Well, let's start with our A, which is going to be what energy, um, no, that's B. We're gonna start with A, is the system isolated or not? Okay, so in order to determine if it's isolated, a really good way to go would be compare the mechanical energies. Because in an isolated system, the mechanical energy is going to be the same. In a closed system, the mechanical energy is going to decrease between point A and B. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the mechanical energy at both the top and the bottom. Okay, So the mechanical energy at the top of the hill Well, at the top of the hill, it's at rest. So that means we have no kinetic energy. So the mechanical energy at the top of the hill is going to be all potential, which is MGH. 
So the mass is a thousand and gravity is 9.81 and the height of the hill is 15 meters. And our mechanical energy at the top of the hill is 147150 joules. Okay. And because I truly cannot help it, I'm going to put this into sig digs. One, two, three, four, five. One point four seven times ten to the power of five joules. All right. So I'm going to scroll down so I've got some more space. Okay, now I'm going to calculate the mechanical energy at the bottom of the hill. So once again, it's potential plus kinetic. Uh, we're at the bottom of the hill. Do we have any potential energy now? No. So that can go. And EK is equal to one half mv squared. So one half, my mass of a thousand, excuse me, a thousand times 15 squared. Plunk that into your calculator. And we've got one, two, zero, one, two, five joules. I am going to put my answer into sig dig. So 1.2, one, two, oops, one, two, three, four, five. There we go. So ladies and gentlemen, look at our answers here. Our mechanical energy at the top of the hill is greater than the energy at the bottom. So that tells us that this is not isolated. If these values are identical, it is an isolated system. If in your initial position, you have more energy than you do in your final position. It's not an isolated system, closed, possibly open. If this number is smaller than this number, you have made a mistake and you need to go back and fix your calculations. Okay, because if at the final position in a system, after energy has been transferred, you have more energy than you started with, write up whatever your discovery is and please put my name on the patent with you and we'll become millionaires because you will have discovered a perpetual, like something that creates energy and goes against the laws of thermodynamics. There is, at this point, there is absolutely no evidence that such a thing can even happen. That goes against the laws of thermodynamics and shows you're creating energy. So A and B either have to be equal or B has to be less than A. Sounds good? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to be looking at the energy transfers here. So, we're going to look at question B. And then, in the video, is finito. So, ladies and gentlemen, at the top of the hill, we have only gravitational potential energy. Okay? And then... As it starts to move, you have EP is going to start to convert to EK, okay? But most of the energy is still going to be in EP, okay? Now, the thing is that as it's moving, our potential energy, some of it is going to be lost due to friction. Now, the friction is both the friction between the ground and the tires and the air resistance, okay? And then at the very bottom of the hill, we only have kinetic energy. Sounds good? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys found that video interesting. Got another practice problem for you to try here. Um, there are, I'm pretty sure in your assignment there's, there's several questions involving uh, this topic because it is important for Physics 30. Now, I hint this assignment. If you guys have noticed um, for this one, if I put one question on a topic, it means that I've decided 
to cut out all the other questions on the topic I would have normally given had we been in classes per normal because they're not showing up in Physics 30. OK, whereas concepts that do show up in Physics 30, if you've got more than one question on a topic, you need that either the topic or the skills that that topic is requiring to solve in Physics 30. OK, it looks like Freya is coming to say hi. Hey, Freya, you want to come say hi? Oh, big stretch. Come, come say hi. Come on. Come on. Come say hi. Oh, you have a gator. Very nice. She's showing off her gator. Yes, she's a good girl with a gator. Want to show it off? Nope. Now she just wants me to scratch her because she's a good girl with a gator. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys have a good day and no fires, injuries, or explosions. Yes, Freya. Come on. Let's try again. Come on. Come on. Good girl. Come on. Come on. Show off your gator. No. She just wants me to hold her stuffed one in my lap. Okay, guys. There you go. You can see how cute she is there. See? You have a girl? Yeah, she's very proud of herself. She has a gator. All right, guys. Hope you all have a good day, and I will talk to you later uh, if I can figure out how to shut this thing off again. You'd think I would have figured this out by now. All right, guys. Talk to you all next video. Really, computer? You won't turn off. It's not turning off. There we go. Bye, guys.